Hello and welcome to our special coverage of the Russian invasion of Ukraine. I'm Ladi Akiri Duluale, the headlines. Ukrainian MI-8 helicopter shot down near Mariupol, a port city in Donetsk. Efforts to evacuate civilians trapped in Mariupol hit a roadblock as Russian forces are reportedly blocking the rescue buses. And Ukrainian envoy to Japan says Ukraine will soon be able to better protect its skies as it expects, quote, super modern military equipment. We begin in Mariupol, the port city near Donetsk, where a Ukrainian Mi-8 helicopter has been shot down by the region's militia with the air defense missile system today, killing all 15 people on board. 17 people, including the crew, were confirmed uh, and are reportedly Ukrainian armed personnel. Only two of them survived. As of uniforms, flight crew operating manuals in Ukrainian language, plane wreckage and other debris were found at the site. Earlier, Chechen leader Ramzan Kadyrov had said that 90 to 95 percent of Mariupol has uh, been taken out of Ukrainian control. And eyewitness videos from Tuesday show people running through a building in central Mariupol as explosions uh, could be heard in the background. Shelling began in the port city four weeks ago when Russia laid siege to it. In the video, explosions can be heard as people run through an amusement center. Later videos show rubble and damage on buildings and cars. Nearly 5,000 people, including about 210 children, have been killed in the city since the Russian siege began, and that's according to a spokesperson for the mayor, Vadim Voychenko. His office said 90% of Mariupol's buildings had now been damaged and 40% completely destroyed, including hospitals, schools, kindergartens, and banks. <laughs> And the past struggle between Ukrainian and Russian-backed forces in Mariupol have continued near a production plant that has become the last major stronghold for Ukrainian soldiers in the besieged port city. The ongoing fighting located southeast of Ukraine in the Sea of Azov has turned it into an arena of constant urban warfare. Once a city of over 400,000 people, Mariupol is now one of the most dangerous places in the country. Subject to constant shelling, the city has no running water, gas, or electricity, an additional obstacle for the remaining residents in the battle for survival. According to the city's mayor's office, around 140,000 people have already fled uh, before the siege began uh, three weeks ago. The mayor's office also says about 150,000 more have exited since then, while nearly 5,000 residents, including children, are reported to have been killed. Given the extent of the fighting on the street, exact figures have proved difficult to independently verify. Ukraine's ambassador to Japan, Sergei Kaczynski, says Ukraine will soon be able to better protect its skies and cities from Russian attacks because it expects, quote, super modern military equipment from the United States and Britain. He says they still have superiority in air force, in airplanes and missiles, but he expects Ukraine to begin to receive the equipment from the U.S. and Britain to protect its skies and cities. According to him, when they fire cruise missiles from a long distance, we cannot get to the launch place. We have to intercept them. That's why we need this uh, modern equipment. Mr. Kaczynski added that from next week, Japan would begin to receive Ukrainian refugees who are now in Poland. They still have superiority in air force, in airplanes and missiles, and we expect those days we begin to receive uh, super modern equipment from United States and soon it will be from Britain uh, to protect our skies, uh, our cities against those, uh, this kind of attack. When they fire cruise missiles from long distance, we cannot get to the launch uh, place. We have to intercept them. That's why we need uh, this modern equipment. We, next week, we expect uh, uh, a new wave of uh, those Ukrainians who are now in Poland uh, and would like to go to Japan. They will come. And uh, we expect that government of Japan, I know that uh, uh, different agencies 
are working now over clear and simple procedure how to receive those people, how to support them. Ukrainian ambassador to Japan. The Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau has met with members of the Ukrainian Parliament who were asking for more military and financial support as their country was in a war with Russia. It's a war between evil and the democratic war, so in this war you have to win. We believe that we will win. We kindly ask for your support. And that's from Lesia Zaburana, a member of the Ukrainian Parliament. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky has said that the situation in the south, as well as the Donbas region, remained extremely difficult and reiterated that Russia was building up forces uh, near the besieged city of Mariupol. For coming in uh, as uh, leaders, uh, as parliamentarians, uh, but also as uh, individuals who have family members back home. I know uh, this can't be an easy trip for you. I know you want to be uh, back there, but what you're doing, what you did in Washington, what you're doing here today uh, really, really matters. I look forward to hearing directly from you on how things are going, but also how how deliberations are unfolding in Parliament and, and what, the, uh, what more Canada can do to help. Uh, obviously, that's a, a big topic of conversation that I have regularly with uh, President Zelensky, with the uh, Kusya has with uh, the Prime Minister and other officials, but uh, hearing directly from you will be very, very important. Ukraine now is a symbol of struggle. We don't want to be a symbol of struggle. We want to be a symbol of victory of victory for democratic world, for democratic values. And now Canada has really historical chance to be our friend and symbol of this victory too. And we believe that together we will win. We will win very quickly. And we will win, really, we will demonstrate all the world our friendship, your support, and our attitude to democratic values. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. It was a pretty difficult decision for us to leave our home, to leave our people, and to go to Canada, to the United States. But we had to do it because it's our duty. We have to represent the interest of our nation. And I would like to tell you that now our nation is more stronger than it was eight years ago, mm -hmm. more unified. We have a great President Zelensky. He is really a national leader and a leader in the world. We have wonderful government. We have wonderful nation. And now we are a cross-party delegation. You know, we are together here because we have one goal, to win. To win in this struggle. And we kindly ask you to support. We have three main issues and we uh, think that you will help us to solve these problems. Let's talk now to Ambassador Frank Esso. He is Nigeria's uh, ambassador to Ukraine once removed. That is, uh, he was, uh, especially at a time when all of this uh, happened. Your Excellency, thank you for your time. Welcome to the program. Ambassador Esso joins us from Abuja. Yeah, good morning, Ladi. I'm very pleased to be here. Let's take a look at this crisis and dial back, uh, because you were there when the events of 2014, you were in Ukraine when the events of 2014 happened. So the question would be, this was something uh, that was foretold before now that this confrontation was coming. Well, you're very right, eh? but incidentally, the Ukrainians didn't see it that way. What happened was that there was an agreement ongoing between Ukraine and the EU called an association agreement. And the then president, uh, who was uh, pro-Russia, decided to abruptly cancel that negotiation. And this was what led to the protests you know, by the entire country. By November 2013, this protest escalated and by February 2014, through what you can call a civilian coup, the president was ousted. And that meant that Russia has lost an ally in Ukraine. But nobody thought that Russia was going to react the way she did. By March, it turned out that Russia had a grand plan 
when they seized Crimea, a territory belonging to Ukraine. And in April, they fomented rebellion in the east of Ukraine, in the Donbass area, particularly in the regions of uh, Donetsk and Luhansk. And that was how this crisis started. But for a long time, the Ukrainians still believed that that was where the crisis was going to end. But it was a mistake on their part. And the problem with Ukraine was that because for a very long time, they were so attached to the Russian way of life, they never bothered to rebuild their military. And that is why today you find the disequilibrium between uh, Russia and Ukraine in terms of military preparedness. If they had built their military during those uh, periods, I don't think this what is happening now should have happened. You know. uh, it just shows the negligence of the part of Ukraine you know, in that respect. But, but a stalemate, it appears, uh, it appears as if a uh, stalemate is building at this point. My apologies for interrupting. It appears as if a stalemate is building because even yeah. though Ukraine is at a disadvantage and its military, as you point out, isn't uh, at any level uh, the, uh, comparable to that of Russia, but because of the backing it is getting from, uh, in terms of weapons, that is, uh, and other aid from uh, the EU, NATO, the US, and other such people. The last clip we played before we came to you was showing Ukrainians asking for help from Canada. Canada had already given, because of that, it seems as if there's some kind of equilibrium, or am I reading it wrongly? No, you're not reading it wrongly. I think a uh, Ukrainian military is being built up gradually. I think uh, the Russian intelligence got it all wrong. They thought they could overrun U Ukraine within two weeks. Given the strength of Ukraine, I mean, they knew in 2014 when they seized Crimea so easily, and Ukraine could not do anything about it. And for the first time, the West had decided to act forcefully on this issue, unlike what they did in 2014, where they just gave in and allowed uh, Russia to have its way. So right now, with the weapons that are streaming in, and I believe more will keep streaming in, this war is not going to end anytime soon. And with Ukrainian army being able to recapture some of the lost grounds around Kyiv, the capital, that means shows that they are gradually rising in confidence. And as more weapons come in, I see a prolonged war you know, between these two countries. And for Russia, once the body bars keep increasing, going back to Russia, I think the people of Russia will start questioning the essence of this invasion. All wars, all wars start and end uh, with diplomacy. Uh, regard, even when there is a victor and a loser, it, they must still come back to the table. So, and you're a diplomat, a veteran diplomat at that, so I want to draw your attention to the diplomatic efforts that are happening. Uh, there were some talks earlier this week in Istanbul, and when the talks started, it seemed as if a glimmer of hope. Uh, because uh, both parties were saying, well, it looked like, well, we are beginning to see some concrete proposals that, uh, that they are to be looked at and all of that. But subsequently, we started hearing something different. No concrete results, nothing to, to chair and all of that. Do you think perhaps too much hope was placed on those talks, particularly because the principal characters, the dramatis personae, shall we say, were not involved directly. And I'm talking about President Zelensky and President Putin. Well, uh, the way I look at it, there's nothing wrong you know, in trying to find a peaceful end to this crisis. But the fact of the matter you know, is that what Russia is putting on the table you know, will be very difficult for any Ukrainian president to accept. The very first condition, agreeing to a status of neutrality, that would be easy for Ukraine to accept because even before the war started, Ukraine was not anywhere close to being a member of NATO because there was still some resistance from countries like Germany, France, and perhaps Italy. So that was far away. But then now, the other conditions are very difficult for any Ukrainian president to accept. And that condition is a question of signing off ownership of Crimea to Russia and recognizing the breakaway republics of uh, Luhansk and uh, Donetsk has been independent. I don't think any Ukrainian president will accept that. So e even if the president was so forced to sign that kind of agreement, I doubt if international law will recognize that because it's just like putting a gun to the head of the president and telling him, sign this. It's not going to be acceptable to any Ukrainian government or even to the international community. So I don't see for now if anything much you know, is going to come out of the current uh, discussions, you know, being held, you know, towards a peaceful end to the, I mean, to the crisis. That's who my do you, view. 
who do you think, who do you think can, shall we use the phrase, knock heads together? I mean, the U.S. would have been the go-to, but the U.S. is already seen as partisan, is on the side of one of the parties, so the other party would not accept the U.S. as a mediator. Uh, who else do you think um, could perhaps step in here and have enough trust and leverage with both sides uh, to ensure that maybe more reasonable uh, demands and more reasonable proposals uh, can be brought to the table and discussed and possibly agreed upon? Well, at this stage, I think it's difficult to really pinpoint any country you know, that can play this very role effectively. Uh, perhaps the Vatican could make a try, but I doubt if Putin, in trying to save face, will pull back from those demands he has set at the table. That's my worry. And the Ukrainians, too, I don't believe will ever accept those conditions. So for now, I, you, you require to be a clairvoyant you know, to look into the future and uh, imagine how things are going to turn out. But then, you know, given the delay is causing, I think that will enable Ukraine time to rearm, be stronger, and be able to resist uh, Russia. And uh, if the stalemate you talked about, you know, becomes uh, a thing to <coughs> a thing of note, then it, it follows, you know, this war is going to drag on for quite some time. And I do not believe the West, you know, is in a hurry to want this war to end immediately. And uh, because it's a process of trying to bleed uh, Russia, in my view. Yes, uh, qu quite a number of people have said that, that uh, the West is interested in, uh, uh, shall we say, degrading Russia's military capacity, and therefore uh, that is being done uh, properly during this period. But in the meantime, uh, Ukraine itself is witnessing massive destruction. Uh, the Russians, uh, from all the videos, from all the reports, from all the pictures, are going about it methodically and so on in such a way that by the time possibly that Russia may have been bled to a point where it is more reasonable, there may be very little, if anything, left of Ukraine in terms of infrastructure or, or, or structures uh, on which to build anything. Do you think that's a reasonable uh, perspective, perhaps? Well, that's a tragedy of the entire situation. Uh, you know, pride gets in the way and uh, positions are, are taken you know, in a manner, you know, that uh, seem uh, irre uh, irreversible. But then, you wouldn't expect Ukraine you know, to just give in. I mean, these people are fighting for their freedom. A country, you know, that has known independence throughout its 1,000 history for only 30 years. So if they lose out this time around, you know, they've lost everything. So they will just keep fighting. And uh, we do hope somehow some mediator, you know, will come along, you know, that will make both sides, you know, to reasonably, you know, come to terms. But I, I, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Well, Russia is methodically, you know, destroying the infrastructure in Ukraine. But if I recall from the, the news, you know, some few days ago, uh, Ukrainian forces were able to haul a missile into a Russian territory. So what it means, you know, that in due course, they might have the capacity to take the war to Russia. And at that point, uh, we'll not see the stalemate, you know, really becoming very strong. Before, before I let you go, Ambassador, let, I, I, one would have expected that under these kind of circumstances, the natural mediator, the role uh, of, of this kind of uh, situation was designed specifically for the United Nations. Uh, and time and time and time again, uh, diplomats like you have expressed disappointment, frustration, at the seeming ineffectiveness of the United Nations when we come to circumstances like this, especially where the more powerful countries of the world are involved in conflict, the UN is unable uh, to step in and perform this role. So I guess maybe I should ask the question, what use does the United Nations then have? Well, we can't really blame the United Nations. If you look at the Charter of the United Nations, the United Nations are as strong as the permanent members want it to be. So in this circumstance, where it is one of the Security Council members that is aggressing on another country, certainly you, you know it's going to be difficult for the UN to step in. And that's a tragedy, really. You know, but there's nothing anybody can do about it. And where the UN is still relevant, can still play uh, important roles you know, in the society, in other conflicts. But it's very, it's very difficult for the UN to step in because of the, uh, the involvement of a member of the Security Council. 
that has a veto to veto whatever decision the Security Council might even reach. And of course, the UN can act, you know, without the Security Council go ahead. So that's where the difficulty lies for the UN. And uh, I think it would be unfair to blame the UN in this circumstance. That's just the situation as it is. So that speaks to the structure of the United Nations, because as you speak now, one can think back and think of similar circumstances where other members, in this case, it was Russia, or it is Russia, but before now, other members, including the United States, when the United States decided that it was going to invade Iraq, uh, it went to the UN. When the UN uh, members said no, uh, other countries also said no. The UN said, uh, the United States said, well, okay, fine. We're going to do it by ourselves, and they did. Uh, the same thing happened when they were going to go into uh, uh, Afghanistan uh, and uh, when China was going to uh, uh, step up uh, activities uh, against uh, Taiwan and so on. There, there's so many examples of this uh, where the UN needs to be reformed. But then is it a case of the chicken and the egg? Who is to carry out the reform? Yeah, the, the people who are supposed to influence the reform I was in the Security Council, just a single veto and everything you know, will come tumbling down. So that's the, that's the tragic uh, situation we are in, really. Uh, big power politics we thought, you know, died, you know, with the end of the Cold War. But incidentally, you know, it's very to say this time around. Uh, both sides you now have been guilty of this, the US, Russia, even China. But then what can the world do, really? The world is powerless, you know, to effect any kind of change, you know, within the United Nations system. But in spite of this flaw, I still believe the United Nations is an essential institution, global institution of that, you know, to help uh, resolve a peace in the world, crisis in the world, rather. Your Excellency, thank you for your time this morning. Uh, we'll of course, have you back as this uh, progresses uh, to give us uh, the unique insight that you have brought to the table uh, this morning. Again, thank you for your time. Yes. Still ahead, Ukraine's President Zelensky says situation in some places are tough, even as he fires two senior members of the nation's security service. Please stay with us. Stay tuned. Welcome back. Ukrainian President Vladimir Zelensky says the situation in the South and the Donbas region remains extremely difficult and said that Russia was building up forces continually near the besieged city of Mariupol. In a rare sign of internal dissent, Mr. Zelensky also said in a video address that he had sacked two senior members of the National Security Service on the grounds that they were traitors. Mr. Zelensky, who often uses colorful imagery, said the Russians were so evil and so keen on destruction that they seemed to be from another world. Uh, quote, monsters who burn and plunder, who attack and are bent on murder. Mr. Zelensky added that Ukrainian forces had pushed the Russians back from both Kiev and Shaniyev Two cities Moscow had announced would no longer be the focus of attacks as they seek to secure the separatist Donbas and Luhansk regions in the southeast. Mr. Zelensky also said he had fired two top officials of the National Security Service, the overall head of internal security, as well as the head of the agency's branch in the Kherson region, but did not give further specific details. The occasion marked the first time he had announced high-profile sackings of those involved in Ukraine's defense. The Pentagon has said it was not clear that Russia's convoy of military vehicles to Kyiv, which once stretched uh, about 40 miles, even exists anymore after failing to accomplish its mission. The stalled convoy became a symbol of Russia's battlefield difficulties and had been repeatedly attacked by Ukrainian forces during the first weeks of the now more than month-long invasion. The Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby said he did not think that they properly planned for logistics and the sustainment of a force that size in the field under combat conditions. Uh, I, I don't even know if it still exists at this point. I mean, it's been now so long. They never, never really uh, accomplished their mission. They never really uh, provided a resupply of any value to Russian forces that were uh, uh, assembling around Kyiv. Um, Never came to, uh, never, never really came to their aid. Uh, the Ukrainians uh, put a stop to the to that convoy pretty quickly um, by, by being very nimble, um, knocking out bridges, hitting lead vehicles, stopping their movement. But I, I've, we've not seen a, an update on uh, on what uh, where those vehicles are, or what they're doing at this point. And at this point, I mean, you know, again, even if 
take our skepticism about the repositioning and just put that to the side for a minute. Over the last several days, we've talked about that the Russians had um, pretty much, even before this this uh, repositioning, had basically established defensive positions, and they weren't. They were digging in. They weren't making any effort to advance on Kyiv. So it, it's questionable uh, whether that resupply convoy would have been much, of much use anyway, because they weren't. They weren't on the move anymore. We don't think that they properly planned for logistics and sustainment of a force that size in the field um, under combat conditions. Clearly, they didn't execute. If they did plan for logistics and sustainment, they didn't execute very well um, because even before that, you know, w w before the convoy became a news story, I mean, we were talking about it. they were running out of fuel, they were running out of food, they were running out of ammunition. So it's not clear to us whether this convoy was a reaction to problems they were experiencing or that it was them trying to be proactive. Doesn't matter, obviously didn't get there. I think it's also a function of Ukrainian resistance and agility and, and frankly, just battlefield smarts. Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby. The head of Britain's armed forces has said that Russian President Vladimir Putin has already lost in Ukraine after a series of catastrophic misjudgments. The chief of the defense staff, Admiral Sir Tony Radikin, made the remarks while speaking at an event hosted by the Institute for Government Think Tank. Admiral Radikin said that like all authoritarians, the Russian president had allowed himself to be misled on the strength of the Russian forces and called Mr. Putin a weaker and more diminished figure, while conversely saying that NATO is stronger and more united. The scenes coming out of Mariupol and elsewhere are horrific, and the coming weeks will continue to be very difficult, but in many ways, Putin has already lost. Far from being the far-sighted manipulator of events that he would have us believe, Putin has damaged himself through a series of catastrophic misjudgments. He has failed to recognize how deeply the notions of sovereignty, democracy, and national identity have taken root in U re Ukraine. Like all authoritarians, he allowed himself to be misled as to his own strength, including the effectiveness of the Russian armed forces. And lastly, he has failed to anticipate the unity and cohesion that exists among the free nations of the world, here in Europe and obviously far beyond. His actions to date have done more to galvanize than divide and have shown Ukraine to have the one thing that Russia conspicuously lacks, which is real friends. What is very clear is that Putin is a weaker and more diminished figure today than he was a month ago. And conversely, NATO is stronger and more united today than at any time I can remember. We're joined now by international relations expert, uh, professor of international relations at Lagos State University, Professor Dakbo Thomas, uh, joins us from the Lhasa campus uh, virtually. Thank you, Prof, for your time. Welcome. Yeah, thank you for having me. We seem to have a stalemate on our hands now with the Russia-Ukraine conflict. Uh, is that the product of strategic thinking or is it uh, a series of uh, unintended consequences that has put us where we are now, so to speak? Well, uh, it's a, it's a two-way thing. For the Russians, it's about the, it's our power politics. It's our power, generally. For the Ukrainians, it's about determination and resilience. In war, or when you, when you think of, I mean, when you consider variables or certain elements, I mean, when you put into consideration power elements, you probably, some nations probably factor in those variables that you can, I mean, that are tangible. And there are others who, factor in those things that are intangible. For the Russians, they believe that they have uh, armaments which they can use against Ukraine. And for the Ukrainians, they believe that, well, at this level 
all they can rely upon is their determination for survival. You know, they have to protect their, apart from the sovereignty, they also have to protect their identity, national identity, because they know that once they miss this opportunity, uh, if the Russians are able to turn their country into a wasteland, then they become history. In, I mean, theoretically, uh, as nobody would ever reckon with them again, they would just be like the. It would just be like the period when the Jews were in diaspora and they never had a land until 1947. So they now have to fight for the wasteland, and that is if they are fortunate to get the land back, because Russia probably will have restored or. Uh, extended uh, the Russian territory into their own, own land. So they now have to see that, <laughs> like uh, they, they have been saying it, that they have to fight to the last man. That's, it's a natural thing to think about. It's a natural thing. There is nothing they can do than to continue to fight. And I'm so impressed. It's the same thing that the U.S. experienced in Vietnam from 1955 to 1975. You know, they could not even achieve any objective. For 20 years, they were unable to penetrate into Vietnam. They were unable to achieve the objective in Vietnam before they withdrew. So I don't know how long this will take, but I see uh, the resilience of the Ukrainians uh, uh, has been comparable to what happened, uh, what the Vietnamese did to the Americans. The question to ask then, of course, is that does that mean that the efforts at diplomacy uh, essentially will not make headway for as long as both sides think that uh, either the resilience of the Ukrainians or the dominance of the Russians uh, will eventually uh, wear down the other person? that diplomacy stands very little chance then? It's very difficult when you are this kind of dialectical di dilemma. It's always very difficult to allow, I mean, to see uh, efficient diplomacy or to see diplomacy uh, at work. It's very difficult. And with a person like Putin, I doubt if diplomacy can work because obviously this war shouldn't have gone this far if diplomacy, I mean, if he, had wanted diplomacy to work. He has defined it as, he has defined Ukraine as an existential threat. But I don't think uh, that is the truth because what happened in 2014 when we attacked Ukraine, Crimea, uh, it was only the US that was uh, feebly, feebly, you know, uh, resisting, I mean, uh, putting up some resistance or, sorry, giving support to the Ukrainians. Unfortunately, after some time, the U.S. also saw it as a problem between two countries. And uh, that's why the Russians, that's why the Russians were able to still retain Crimea till today. They have, I mean, they have access to um, Crimea. Uh, whether we like it or not, theoret I mean, uh, theoretically, they still see Crimea as part of their country uh, and belonging to Russia. So uh, diplomacy cannot work for somebody like Putin because he believes in power. He believes in the use of power. And it, he has exhibited it comprehensively in this war. And uh, I, I heard you using the word methodically, uh, that the Russians have been methodically dealing with uh, the Ukrainians by decapacitating their power and everything. I believe the appropriate words to use will have been barbarically. You know, because in every war you fight, in every war, and that's why nations are devising precision munitions. You, they are devising precision munitions so that they can avoid um, massive collateral damage. In, in this particular war, you have not heard of collateral damage. It's a, it's a deliberate thing. It's a total, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's like a designed agenda to turn um, Ukraine to a wasteland. It's, it's planned, it's planned, you know, because the targets are not even military infrastructure. They are not even uh, the, 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 the armaments, the armory. They are civilians. They are residential buildings, you know. So the, the military infrastructure and um, the armaments have become collateral damage in this instance. The major objective is to decimate and exterminate, you know, which I think, which I consider to be genocide, a genocidal mission. 
You know, so I don't see, nobody's talking about collateral damage. In 1991, 2003, when the U.S. went to Iraq, in fact, the, the, the people were talking about collateral damage. The U.S. was even apologizing I mean, profusely for even making any error. And it was as a result of this that they devised and improved upon their technology of precision. So when you have precision munitions and everything, why are you targeting civilians? You, so you we see, you can see the theater, the theater in the in, in Cape. You can see what happened. They deliberately attacked because those people even wrote children are in this theater. And then all the same, they still sent missiles into that place. And that is where they still, they, have in, uh, uh, they, they have the largest casualties in this war. About 300 people or so dying in, a, in that particular place. And you can see sending missiles to people who are on the bread queue. You know, it's, it's, it's not methodical. That's barbaric. That's barbaric. That's not being methodical. Methodical means you are going to decapacitate. You must have your intelligence um, uh, report at work. And then you target those military infrastructure, those uh, military, I mean, the armaments and everything belonging to your up to your adversary. Those are the things you, uh, you, 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 you target. And then you diminish the capacity for, uh, for, for resistance. But when you start killing people, I mean, look at it. Even during the Second World War, World War, we are talking about World War. We never, at this particular period, we never had a situation where about 4 million people would be considered refugees. The moment this war started, in less than one week, we had about 1 point something, 1.3 million or 2 million, you know? So as refugees, I mean, it's a very serious thing. It shows that, look, the civilians are the target and the uh, residential people, I mean, residential buildings and everything, they are the, they are the focus. It's, 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 it's a different thing entirely. I think it's a destination agenda or a wasteland agenda. Indeed, uh, we'll, have, we'll have to see how, how all this pans out, uh, Prof. Uh, but for the meantime, let me just thank you for your views and time. Uh, of course, uh, if what you have uh, uh, think, uh, if you've, what you've said will happen, happens, then of course uh, there will be more opportunities uh, ahead to take a look at the developments. Then, but for now, Professor Dakwa Thomas, thank you for your time uh, this morning. Thank you for having me. Delhi residents have voiced their support for Russia even after the international community began isolating Moscow for its attack on Ukraine. Lured by steep discounts following Western sanctions on Russian entities, India has bought at least 13 million barrels of Russian crude oil since the country invaded Ukraine in late February, compared with about 16 million barrels for the whole of last year. Russia has also long been India's biggest supplier of defense equipment, uh, despite growing purchases from the United States in the past decade. Defense analysts say Russian supplies are more cost competitive and vital for India as it faces a superior Chinese military. India and Russia are also trying to work out a rupee-ruble payments mechanism to maintain trade between them. Because we have a lot to gain from this, you know, because uh, uh, see, like when you uh, see that we are now directly buying the oil from Russia, we couldn't do that earlier, like you know, and we can now do that. And uh, we have a long standing trade relation, like we you know, we buy our uh, military aircrafts and all from Russia, we have this Brahmos missile joint venture with Russia. So, I think it's pretty good thing that, like, you know, that we are pretty vocal about our support for Russia now. All prices seesawed today ahead of a meeting of consuming nations to discuss a new release of emergency oil reserves alongside a huge planned release by the United States. United States West Texas intermediate crude futures dipped six cents to $100.22 a barrel after trading as high as $101.75. The contract had slumped 7% yesterday. Brent crude features rose five cents to $104.76 a barrel after dropping 5.6% on Thursday. The May contract expired yesterday at $107.91. The planned U.S. release uh, caused uh, yesterday's falls. On Friday, the two benchmark contracts were each headed for a weekly loss of around 13%, uh, their biggest uh, in two years. 
So let's talk about uh, this uh, with Ini. Ini joins me. Ini John McQuad of our business desk joins me. Hi, Ini. Good morning. The, let's start, of course, uh, with the update on the ruble for gas. That's supposed to take effect today. Yeah, takes effect. Uh, the, de the decree was done yesterday, so it's now official um, for unfriendly countries, according to uh, President Putin. They have to pay for uh, gas with rubles. But it's not like they have to go and source for the rubles. So there's a system where uh, in Gazprom Bank, and accounts will be opened for them, for the, for the countries. And then when they pay their money, then Gazprom will now convert it to rubles, you know, before they can now purchase. But they will have an account, like, like a ruble account in Gazprom, because obviously Gazprom is, is a it's Russian a, bank. Russia, and, exactly. and it's probably affected by these sanctions. Exactly. So, I mean, what, it's, it's just different from what they will be doing. And that's why Germany and the other European countries are saying, well, they are not going to follow this line and it's against their uh, contract signed before now and they don't want to do it. So it's really a, a harsh one at this time. I remember yesterday we talked about uh, Germany. Uh, they've activated their emergency plan and, and right. they have started that. So uh, there are talks of inflation because even with the anticipation of this, but we have to tell you just before I came in, we saw that uh, they're still pumping gas. You know, Russia had said they would stop but they are still pumping gas because there's also the other side. Let's not forget, Russia needs this money for their economy, especially with all of the sanctions. Right. You know, yesterday, uh, as some European countries were talking about, let's not just freeze their asset, let's actually block it. You know, so they're, they're, they're actually feeling the impact. So if they just turn off the gas and they are not getting any revenue from any of these countries, they will also feel the impact. So even though, yes, uh, the uh, European countries, they need it for power, they need it for their industries, they need it for household and all that, Russia also needs the revenue to run the economy. So it may not be that easy because some analysts have said, oh, they will not. I mean, we never can sell with President you Putin. You can. You can hardly predict you, if him. You put, if you back him into a corner. He might just do it. But for now, I mean, the gas is still pumping to European countries and things are still the way they were even though the threat is still on the table. Then there's, there's of course, the issue of the oil prices. Mm. Um, yesterday, we had talked about the fact that because President Biden had ordered this release uh, from the U.S. reserves, yes. and so it tended to provide some calm, yeah. uh, sort so, of... So that's why, I mean, from what you, you read, uh, prices have tapered from yesterday, to, from the announcements, even before it's done. You know the way markets are, they're just sensitive. Once they hear anything, investors start to move along right. that direction. But it is also important to note that this cannot sufficiently cover uh, the supply that Russia brings to the table. So prices are still high. And like President Putin says, um, he doesn't know how long it will take before we feel the impact. And this is only for six months. One million barrels per day for six months. That is all this uh, he's allowed to. Because, I mean, he even had to activate a kind of a, a war uh, um, uh, regime or, you know. Yes, yeah, so I mean, war situation as on. Yes. There's a provision for that. Provision for that. And that it's supposed to be within the U.S., not supposed not to be outside. used outside. Exactly. So not it, outside. Several, several provisions mm. uh, had, to be, uh, had to be adjusted for that purpose. Mm. Mm. Well, we, we, we're going to a weekend now. So, again, uh, possibly on Monday, we'll, we'll, we'll have to take a yes, look at what that this... Debts, that debt default... It's due on Monday it's now. It's due on Monday, the 4th. And you need, even before we go there, um, you, you, you know, we talked about the aviation sector... Indeed. ...and uh, what's going on there. And we see that President Putin, seeing that the... the sector is really tight now yesterday promise was going to give i think about a billion rubles to activate because all those planes they seized remember the 10 billion dollar yes. worth of plane that they seized well um some of those airplanes have been able maybe i think they were able to leave the country to some friendly countries and so the country you know they are on lease yes the corporates who own those planes were able to collaborate with some of those countries and they got some of them but i learned about 453 of it are, are still with Russia, and they have technically become Russian, Russian uh, aircraft. aircraft. And President Putin now has released about a billion uh, rubles for the maintenance and, and the work and replacement of parts, which is very difficult for them because, you know, the major uh, distributors have cut off work and uh, a relationship with them. All this is tough. Uh, 
how does all of this affect you? Business Morning, Business Incorporated, Ine and Ladi will be around to give you uh, the package, the full package. This is just a snippet of it. Thank you, Ine. <laughs> Thank uh, you for having me. We'll take a break now. Still to come, New Jersey Brewery feels Ukraine's a ripple effect from rising grain prices this time. Please stay Thanks for staying tuned. We'll take a look at sports now. FIFA President Gianni Infantino is appealing for peace in Ukraine amidst calls to expel Russia. Speaking at the 72nd Annual FIFA Congress in Doha, Mr. Infantino calls for an end to the conflict, adding that he hopes football can play a small part in establishing peace and understanding. Please stop conflicts and wars. Please, for our children, for our future. Please engage in dialogue, even with your worst enemy. Please try to come together. And football will be there and will help in working together for peace. We live in an aggressive world. We live in a divided world. But as you know, I am a big believer in the power of football to bring people together and to cross cultural boundaries. What I want to say now is that uh, once this uh, terrible conflict is over, and all other conflicts around the world as well. Hopefully, very soon, football can play a small part in rebuilding relationships, in establish peace and understanding. And we will be there at the forefront of doing that. And the Russia World Cup in 2018, four years ago, was uh, by all means a great World Cup, a great success sportingly and culturally. But obviously, it did not solve the problems of the world. It did not even solve the problems in the region. Meanwhile, Ukrainian Football Association President Andrei Pavelko, who addressed the FIFA Congress in an emotional recorded video from war-torn Kiev wearing a bulletproof vest, relayed that the war had taken the lives of Ukrainians in the football community. With Russian representatives listening on in Qatar, Mr. Pavelko said the FA has not had the opportunity to develop the game since February 24th and instead had been defending the country and resisting what he described as the military aggression of Russia. Dear FIFA President Gianni Infantino, dear members of football family, dear friends, Radi Vitati, President of all countries of the world, except one of them, who is located in this zone. Unfortunately, today I cannot be together with you. Starting from 24 July, we in Ukraine do not have the opportunity to develop our beloved game. For more than a month, we will defend our country та чинимо супротив воєнної агресії з боку Російської Федерації. І на превеликий жаль, протягом цього періоду ми регулярно отримуємо сумні звістки про загибель представників футбольної спільноти України. Вони гинуть від кулі снарядів агресора, одні з найбільших армій світу. Футбол відійшов на другий план, тому що кожного дня в нашій країні гинуть дорослі та діти. Як ви знаєте, Україна подарувала футбольному світу трьох володарів золотого м'яча, а можливо, серед загиблих дітей міг бути ще один золотий талант нашої країни. Українська асоціація футболу створила спеціальний кризовий штаб, який працює 24 на 7. Я висловлюю глибоку вдячність футбольним асоціаціям, які допомагають нашій країні і підтримують українців. Дякую тим, хто приймає в себе наших футбольних представників, особливо футбольну молодь, яка вимушена була покинути свою країну, рятуючись від війни. Meanwhile, a senior Russian official administrator Alexei Sorokin Says the country is serious about a bid to host the European Championships in 2028 
or 2032, while its national and club teams are being unfairly punished because they have done nothing wrong. Mr. Sorokin, who was CEO of the 2018 World Cup in Russia and a former member of FIFA's ruling council, says that his country had everything in place to host a tournament. Russian clubs and national teams have been suspended from FIFA and UEFA competitions due to the war in Ukraine, which denied Russia the chance to qualify for this year's World Cup finals through the European playoffs. What does Russian football have to do with, with all this? Or what, what has Russian football done wrong? Uh, I don't find any, any clause in uh, FIFA statutes that were broken by the Russian football. Uh, what's happening is, uh, is received with disappointment by Russian fans that the uh, European event has been taken away, that the team is not playing. That's, that's very disappointing for Russian fans. Of course, we're, they're emotional about this. Uh, it's, uh, it's very sad for us to see refusals of uh, other players, of other teams to play with our, with our team. We, we could understand, I think, again, as a my own personal opinion, we, we could understand the, the removal to another neutral territory, which is done, but to simply take away a team. Finally, struggling with the rising cost of grains, aluminium and fuel due to inflation and Russia's invasion of Ukraine, New Jersey Brewery, four city brewing company, says it will have to raise prices in its tap room soon. The craft beer maker cans its product in Orange, New Jersey, in a labor-intensive operation, weighing the filled cans by hand as they are packed into boxes. So far, the company has managed not to raise prices over the invasion, which Russia calls its special operation in Ukraine, but that can't last. Ukraine is amongst the world's leading exporters of grain and vegetable oils and has suspended exports of rye, oats, millet, buckwheat, salt, sugar, meat, and livestock since the invasion and introduced export licenses for wheat. A co-owner of the brewery says the war in Ukraine will likely have a ripple effect and has been compounded by inflation and everything from the barley that is a key ingredient in brewing their beer to aluminium for the cans, shipping and electricity prices. It's at least going to be one to two dollars more probably per pour in the tap room. Uh, probably a couple of dollars on each case per keg. Yeah, nothing extreme, but we have to cover our costs because the, the costs have been pretty significant. Um, we do see the difference from paying a certain amount per month to a higher amount for the same amount of grain. Grain has gone up, I mean, 18, 20, 25 cents a pound. So when you're talking about hundreds, maybe a thousand pounds per batch. You're, it, it's a lot of money, and we're trying to keep our prices. You know, we haven't raised our prices, but it's still it's a challenge. Um, I, I think I think the problem in the Ukraine is going to ripple, you know, and it's not going to affect us right right now, but it's gonna it's going to affect us in general over the time. And then inflation, you know, we're going to be forced to raise our prices. But again, you don't want to price yourself out of the market. Four pack, sixteen dollars, eighteen dollars. Four pack could be, you know, you don't want to go too much past 20 depending on the style so it's a challenge depending on where we get it from it's gone on anywhere from eight cents with on the u.s side to over 20 cents on the european side so the the german malts the the english malts have gone up significantly so again you know a thousand pounds times 20 cents is you know a significant raise in in price so uh the grain and the aluminum has gone up you know, several cents. So it's a lot. I mean, I remember when aluminum cans were like 16 cents. Now we're talking 21 cents, we're talking about it going up again. So it's a big difference. You know, we, you know, we get a pallet of cans. There's 3,112 cans due to, due to math. And it, it's, it's a big jump. Who would have thought every day there are consequences for this war uh, between Russia and Ukraine? This time on Brewing. That's where we wrap up the show this morning. Thanks for being uh, with us. There'll be an update at five uh, later on uh, today. Do watch out for that. And the show uh, is uh, back tomorrow at uh, seven in the evening. Thanks for watching. Do have a wonderful weekend ahead. I'm Ladia Kuri Duluali.